Uh, first, for, first of all, I have uh, prepared a PDF file of the slides I'm going to present. So uh, if someone can try that so to be sure it works, because uh, copying a link from Dropbox is not uh, a piece of cake. And I also put uh, 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 actually dirty sheet, uh, cheat sheet uh, in terms of mathematics, but it can help uh, people because uh, most of the material I'm going to present uh, now is a follow-up from Jesus Carrera presentation this morning, but a little bit more advanced in terms of uh, mathematical tools, and therefore it can be difficult for some of you. Please do, do not hesitate to interrupt, because it's, uh, uh, the, the purpose of a uh, summer school is to uh, bring uh, everybody uh, to a certain uh, level of understanding. And I'm going to talk about flow in high permeability porous media. I will not comment too much on, on that high permeability. I, I don't have a clear definition of that. Or instead, I have a clear definition, but not in terms of permeability. This is a, a medium for which there will be uh, additional uh, physics compared to the physics which has been presented this morning by Jesus Carrera, which leads to Darcy's law. So essentially, if you have a medium in which you can push the Reynolds number, for instance, or the capillary number, or the bond number, then uh, I will call that uh, a high permeability plus media application, but it's not clear cut in terms of uh, a quantitative uh, quantitative value. And uh, the uh, uh, outline of my presentation will be essentially on, on some theoretical aspects, which will uh, I will essentially develop in the case of a one phase flow. But since this is uh, really correlated, I will give a few uh, a few uh, ideas on how those. Uh, High permeability effects can play a role in the case of, of two-phase flow. Essentially, I will discuss the phenomenology of one-phase flow when you increase the Reynolds number, and I will show that there are many different uh, uh, transitions uh, and, and possibilities, and this uh, phenomenology actually translates into different equations and different, uh, different properties uh, uh, as a function of the, of the Reynolds number. The, uh, there are many applications uh, in uh, uh, near wells, uh, in cast, uh, and in also in uh, manufacture, manufacture media, uh, we have worked on different. We have worked on different, uh, different problems. Uh, so I'm not going to take uh, one example, but uh, what I I'm going to do is to try to use the upscaling techniques to understand uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, this problem. And uh, by upscaling, I'm essentially. Uh, mean something which is uh, uh, represented uh, here in a very sketchy manner, which is uh, uh, a two-scale system in which I have a porous scale here, which is characterized by a few characteristic lengths, which are supposed to be smaller than the large scale of the problems you are interested in. And the questions are uh, several uh, folds. First, there is a question of so-called separation of scales. Most of the time I will use this kind of approximation, but I will comment on that because in, in real life we rarely actually have that. <laughs> so we have to be very careful about the manipulation of that. Uh, and uh, the, second, uh, the, the second and third problems are, well, uh, can I introduce a smoothing operator uh, that will start from the pore scale equation and develop macro scale equations and if I am able to do that, uh, I, I probably will be able to explicitly provide a link between the micro scale and the macro scale. And uh, this link actually will essentially uh, give a way to estimate effective properties uh, in, in these macro scale equations. The calculation of effective properties is uh, now uh, sort of a routine in many, many uh, applications, for instance, in petroleum engineering. Uh, starting with the development of uh, X-ray tomography in the past, uh, the past decades. So this is, a, this is the objective. And, uh, well, I, I'm going to actually skip the most of the material on this, uh, this uh, slide. You will have that in, in, the, in the PDF. But I will essentially... Uh, so the, the idea first is there are many different techniques. And I, I'm not the pope of any, uh, any single uh, technique. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, given the, my objective, I will essentially look at something which is, uh, uh, I'll call upscaling with closure, which is uh, actually uh, based on the following idea. First, I will seek the pore scale field 
in terms of the smoothing value plus a deviation. So I will get two types of equation, a macroscale equation and a microscale equation, which are equivalent. Uh, and if I am able to uh, find a solution of this couple problem, most of the time, but not all the time, I will be able to relate the deviation to some microscale uh, properties. For instance, the gradient of uh, pressure or the, uh, the average velocity or things like that. This is uh, interesting for the discussion, but I would not like to uh, uh, overestimate the interest, which is uh, quite strong in my view, of over, uh, over, um, over approaches. So this uh, uh, said, uh, well, I, I need to introduce a few definitions. Uh, first, uh, I will, for this presentation today, this lecture today is not a comprehensive presentation of upscaling techniques. Uh, I, I need, would need more than one hour to do that. So I'm, I'm going to just give some uh, insight on, on what's going on here. And uh, so I will uh, use essentially uh, one, one path to introduce that, which is through the definition of microscale quantity in terms of some sort of average value uh, through a convolution product, but mostly today it is enough to understand uh, uh, that with the classical uh, average value. So any, for instance, the pressure of the beta phase will be uh, uh, average over the volume of the beta phase divided by the volume of the porous medium and then we'll get uh, the, uh, some average, average pressure. And there are two types of definition which are very, very interesting. The, uh, uh, first, uh, let us give the notation here for the phase indicator. The phase indicator is 1 in the beta phase and 0 elsewhere. And the volume fraction of the beta phase is just the average of gamma beta. And that's given. Then I can introduce uh, another uh, phase average, which is the intrinsic phase average, which is the average here divided by the volume fraction. For instance, if the pressure is a constant, this average will give the, the constant times the, the volume fraction, which is not the, very useful, but it might be, uh, for instance, if you are talking about concentration. But uh, it will, uh, the, the intrinsic here will be exactly uh, this pressure. So, so that those two definitions are ubiquitous in, in, uh, in uh, upscaling uh, techniques. And I, I have reminded here of the uh, uh, separation of scale uh, assumption in which I have uh, the small scale here, the scale of the average values, some eventually some scales of heterogeneities and so forth. Uh, that's something I will discuss, uh, discuss later. So given these definitions, then uh, the upscaling uh, with a closure uh, problem can be sch schematically represented like that. Uh, let us start uh, by the, f the, the, f the field at the power scale for a very simple problem, which is a diffusion in a system in which the uh, the diffusion variable is uh, heterogeneous. Can be, for instance, heat transfer in a porous medium. So, a very simple, very simple problem. Uh, uh, if the, uh, the, I took the, the steady state situation here, and uh, the, the field can be, for instance, uh, something like that, the, the black line, which has uh, some oscillation at the small scale L, and obviously, uh, some average trend uh, at the, uh, uh, at the, at the uh, average. So the, the, the technique essentially is to split this field into the average signal and the deviation. And so I have two problems which are uh, schematically represented here, the average signal and the fluctuation. And here we see the interest of introducing that is that the, the, uh, locally the deviation looks almost periodic. This is just locally, but that's enough to develop a few things. And so I have a couple problem, which is technically written here, the average of the equation. So I have here something which is not closed in the sense that there is the deviation in this equation. Uh, and uh, I have uh, another equation, which is the original power scale equation for the uh, governing equation for this deviation set tilde. I have to solve those two problems. It looks more complicated. And this is where uh, upscaling in the case of nice separation of scale works very well because in that case yeah, you can actually come up with a simple relationship between the uh, gradient of the average concentration and the deviation with something which essentially depends only on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the power scale original problem. So, so if I am, this is called a mapping vector here, so I can map the gradient uh, the, the, 
towards the, uh, the, the, the deviation. And so, how does that work? Well, <laughs> first I have to calculate that. I can do that once, whatever the initial boundary value problem you solve, because it does not depend on, on, on grad C. And usually, uh, and that's becoming a routine now in many, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, software associated to, uh, to X-ray tomography. So you take a picture, you solve for this B, and you get something which is the effective properties, which is written here. Don't, don't look at that, it's not very important. But this effective property is the one that goes into the macroscale equation. So the picture is the following. I have the polar scale signal, I split that signal into two things. Uh, I try to come up with an approximate solution of this couple problem. And if I am able to do that, then I have two outcomes. I have a macroscale equation in which the effective property is given by some problems to be solved over, over, a, uh, over a representative uh, volume of, 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 the, of the system. Ah, this is a, uh, this is the uh, nice uh, and friendly fairy tale of upscaling. Uh, it turns out that it's not always a fairy, a fairy tale. Uh, and this is the case, for instance, if one is interested by the, the one phase flow problem. So the power scale equations here are written uh, with, uh, the, in the case of uh, uh, constant density. So I have the total mass balance. Then I have the Navier-Stokes equation here written for a, a Newtonian, uh, Newtonian fluid. So mu beta is a constant. And I have an um, inertia term. I have the pressure term and the uh, gravity terms. And I have here this uh, 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 viscosity term, which has been discussed this morning by, um, by Jesus Carrera. I have a boundary condition here at the interface between the fluid and the solid, which is the zero velocity. And uh, it turns out that those equations depend essentially, uh, are the, the solution of those equations are essentially determined by a few, uh, a few dimensionless uh, terms. And the most important is, is the Reynolds number here, which I define with uh, um, an average velocity, something that depends, uh, is characteristic of the power scale characteristic length and the uh, uh, dynamic the viscosity here. Uh, and so I, I, here I, I clearly see something that if the Reynolds number is small, then I get something which is essentially the Stokes equation. Stokes equations are essentially uh, this, uh, these terms equal to zero. So I have at least one, uh, one limiting regime, which is uh, called the creeping regime. So this is the, the, the Navier-Stokes equation in which I put uh, the Reynolds number equal to zero. And it has been discussed this morning. It leads to Darcy's law. We will review that rapidly. Now, if I increase the Reynolds number, I will have a series of uh, uh, things that will happen. The, then the nonlinear non term and the transient term will play a role. And I'm going to uh, try to explain that. Uh, but the difficulty is that the, there are various regimes and transition between those regimes. The, the picture actually is quite complicated, and I'm try, I will try to summarize that. Yes? Uh, the beta shows up a lot here. Um, can you help us? What is your beta? Sometimes it's a superscript, sometimes it's a subscript. Can you talk to us about what beta is? Beta is the beta phase. It's just a phase. It's just a phase. It's just a phase. Yes. It, uh, it's uh, just uh, defined here. In the, uh, the, this is the, this is the beta is the beta phase, and sigma is the, is the solid phase. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I have a what was yes. The characteristic length in the Sorry. Yes, that's a good question. When I uh, put, uh, oops, where it is? When I put a small l here, this is the pore scale characteristic length. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there are many different choices. I will actually comment on that later because this is something which is. Uh, actually has uh, created uh, furious debates uh, uh, in the literature. So therefore, it's, it's characteristic of the small scale, the poor scale. That's enough for the moment. But I uh, will come back to that problem <laughs> later. <laughs> I, uh, uh, another, another question? Uh, for in the closure equation that you shown, where you, see that the, you say that the fluctuation is proportional to the gradient of the average concentration, uh, could you, is that an assumption, or could you take some uh, well, uh, my plans were not to discuss that in, in too many details, but I can comment on, on that. Uh, this, um, there are several constraints behind that, actually. Uh, the, the first one is I took uh, steady-state equation, 
But if I would have taken time in this uh, equation, then I would have to have a separation of scale, of time scales between the, the macro scale and the micro scale equations. And also, <coughs> Uh, if I had a time-dependent equation, then the ratio, the, the bounds for k should be limited. Otherwise, there is another type of, uh, of equation or, or a solution that will be more complicated, for instance, with the time convolution here between the derivative, the time derivative of that and that, or over proposal like, for instance, the, the continuous time random walk uh, method. So, so the, 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 as I said, this is a fairy tale <laughs> here. Because I, I, have a, I have assumed that everything works well, we have a, have a separation of time scale, have a separation uh, of uh, length scales, uh, and it, it works very well. Is disclosure is, is a result of that assumption? It's, uh, it's a result of these assumptions. <laughs> so you, you, you have to uh, actually, uh, the, the, you have to work on, on all the terms in there and see which is important, which is not depending on the, on the assumption you made. Well, uh, actually, we will uh, have uh, some illustration of that difficulty for, for the Navier-Stokes problem uh, later. So, the, uh, let us try to develop the, the methodology I uh, already introduced. So, I introduced the pressure deviation and velocity deviation. And the, uh, the equations actually are uh, for, uh, for those uh, uh, problems are, are the same. So the, the total uh, mass balance equation is just average ra easy, rapidly and we have here which is a filtration velocity. Filtration velocity is the velocity that uh, pops up in Darcy's law. Uh, uh, this is uh, important. Here this is the boundary condition at the interface between the fluid phase and the solid phase. And here we see that this velocity deviation actually has the same order of magnitude as the average velocity. That's something very important. I will comment later for the second presentation on non-Newtonian flows uh, this afternoon. And I, I have an average, uh, average equation. I don't go through all the technical details, but uh, I, I have several terms. Uh, all those terms are averages, which are most of the time uh, the, the taken, uh, the, the, most of the time, the derivatives of these terms is taken, and I will use that uh, later. I have uh, here the so-called Brinkman terms, but which are also average value with derivatives here. And I have uh, here the, uh, uh, the uh, stress uh, at the uh, interface. So this is uh, actually the, the, uh, the, the most important term in the system because it, it is essentially defined by the uh, uh, gradient of a, a small-scale velocity field. Uh, so this is something like uh, the velocity divided by small l. And here I have, for instance, the average velocity divided by capital L. So if I compare the, those terms, for instance, here, the, they, are, they are different, and I will use that uh, later. So remember, here I have that, count, that sort of order of, mass, uh, of magnitude estimate. Question. Yes? So what is the supposed beta that I'm using? Sorry? Beta, ah, well, beta is just a definition I have introduced before. Yeah, that's why I, I gave the, uh, the beta is, uh, the, this notation is the, for the intrinsic phase average. So it's not an exponent, it's just a definition, mostly uh, f for historical reasons, uh, but it, it, this is the way it is. Uh, I am integrating only over the beta phase and I'm dividing by the volume of the beta phase. So that's intrinsic. This is why I, when I said if you have a constant, you get a constant. Otherwise, the, over, the, the total average gives the constant times the, positive, the volume fraction of the beta phase. So those two uh, are very important. So this is uh, the candidate for the macro scale, macro scale equation. And you see there are many terms. These are all macro scale terms, uh, but these are not and these are not. So what can we do with that? Well, <coughs> I could play with a lot of uh, order of magnitude estimates and I'm going to do uh, that more simple by looking at the phenomenology if I uh, solve a local problem here. Uh, actually, this, uh, uh, the, the uh, problem for the pressure deviation can be written under this form uh, where uh, I did not introduce the, the velocity deviation, but I could. It's not very important. So this is a local problem in which h 
is a, is a constant. And what do I have here? I have here the velocity field for a porous medium uh, uh, containing several, uh, several unit cells. This is a very simple porous medium. It's a periodic cell. And what I see here, if I assume that the uh, microscale pressure gradient is a constant, I have a, const uh, I have a velocity field here. And I can clearly see that after a while, the average velocity will be a constant. So what do I have? If I look at the pore scale velocity, I, I have a, if I start with zero, I have a transient system which is characteristic, characterized by this uh, time scale, which is L2, uh, so the small scale over the uh, uh, viscosity of the beta phase, the dyna dynamic viscosity. Most of the time in our application, this is small. Uh, L is a few microns or millimeters, or, and, and nu is 10 to the minus 5, 10 to, depending on, on the feet you are, you, are, uh, uh, you are taking into account. So most of the time this is small. There are other cases, but I will assume that this is small. So I have a transient problem, which uh, even I, I will not uh, uh, care too much. And I have a constant power scale velocity at a given point, and I could draw different curves here, and I have a constant average velocity. This is the case when the Reynolds number tends to zero. So here the uh, consequences are, I have a locally, for this local problem, I have a constant macro scale pressure gradient, and I have a constant velocity, and therefore if I look at Reynolds number zero, I have drop all those uh, transient terms. And here, if I look at the Brinkman terms uh, far from, from the boundary, then it can be estimated li like that. I have uh, the average uh, velocity divided by the large scale uh, characteristic length per square. And these terms can be estimated like that. So therefore, in most cases, uh, I have uh, to keep in the final equation, final problem, I have to keep those, only those terms. So what I need essentially to know is to compute this, uh, this uh, uh, value. So that's the um, creeping flow case. Well, what, uh, what's happening if I increase the Reynolds number? If I increase the Reynolds number, I, I have a first uh, uh, stage, which is called laminar inertial. So the, uh, if I look at the uh, uh, response of the system for the same pressure gradient, uh, I have a still a transient uh, situation here, then the rapidly a steady state situation. The average velocity, same stuff. I have a, an average uh, velocity that becomes uh, quasi steady. And uh, if I work out uh, with, with that, I still have those important terms. But of course, this term will, will be different from the one corresponding to the small Reynolds number. So essentially, uh, I will have something which looks similar, but with a different expression here for, the, for this term. So again, we have a, uh, locally, the, uh, this term is, 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 a, is a constant, and this term uh, is, is a constant that is proportional to the velocity of the, of the system. Well, now what's happening if I increase the Reynolds number? Then it's a little bit more involved. You have here uh, an example of solution, and you see that uh, you have a transient evolution of the system. You lose periodicity. The, uh, uh, the field here is not the same as the field here. Uh, it's a little bit different. And if I look at the pole scale velocity, for instance, at the given point, I, I, I clearly see those uh, time-dependent uh, uh, variation. Still, if I look at the average velocity after a, a short time, it, it becomes more or less uh, uh, constant. And this actually situation uh, is still a candidate to use the same macroscale equation in terms of the form of the equation. If I would increase the Reynolds number, then I will get something which is called a, a macroscale turbulence. And uh, the situation is, is the following. If I uh, increase the Reynolds number uh, up to a certain level, but not too much, I have what is called localized turbulence. Localized turbulence is, uh, means that I, I have a transient pore scale field. The average uh, velocity or the time average velocity remain, is, a, is, a, is a nearly constant over this uh, uh, a certain uh, uh, number of periodic unit cell. 
the, uh, if I have a periodic medium, to get that, I need larger volumes. The, the, uh, uh, if you don't force periodicity, if you take a very big system, you will uh, realize that increasing Reynolds number, you will need to put in your description of the velocity field more unit cells if you want. Uh, uh, if you want. And then there is a final stage uh, in terms of this discussion, which is uh, true macroscale turbulence, in which the macroscale velocity depends on time and the pressure, macroscale pressure depends on time, and this will call for a, a different, uh, different expression. But up to that, I, I can work out for the macroscale equation uh, with the, the, the almost the same, uh, the same uh, situation. Why is it so complicated? Well, this is Navier-Stokes equations are complicated. They are prone to bifurcations of various types, uh, and I have described two different types here. Uh, this one is called supercritical instability, which it arises, for instance, when you look at the flow uh, past uh, uh, a cylinder or a sphere. So you increase the Reynolds number and you, you actually branch to another situation. That's, that's fine. It's, it, it looks uh, quite uh, smooth if you want. And I have the subcritical instability here. So if I look at uh, quasi flow, for instance, if I have a very nice lab, I can go up to a Reynolds number of 50,000, for instance, and still see the Poiseuille flow that uh, Jesus Carrera has presented this morning. But otherwise, if you have a, a car going next to your lab, then it will branch to another situation, uh, which is completely different. So, so the picture, sorry? Could you just quickly explain what bifurcation is? Uh, bifurcation is just a, a, a change in the, the, the type of the solution. So here, for instance, I have a Poiseuille flow. And here I have something which is called turbulent flow. So the velocity field and pressure field are completely different. Uh, so the, um, that's the, the, the reason why Navier-Stokes equations are so complicated to upscale is because of this uh, particular, particular uh, case. And what we know is that, I already mentioned that, that uh, those bifurcation depends on the Reynolds number, the number of unit cells, and the topology. Topology, uh, I will comment that, uh, on that uh, later, but this is classical because if you have a system which is prone to that type of bifurcation, it will behave differently from, from this one, for instance. The other difficulty is that this is difficult to estimate order of magnitudes. Uh, if I go to a small Reynolds number, I can play with the numbers. It's, uh, it becomes a linear system and therefore it's easy to say, well, the velocity is uh, smaller than well, whatever. If I have a fully nonlinear system, then it depends on, on, on a lot of uh, different things. And therefore, uh, this, this is why this is very important for flow in highly permeable media to rely on DNS, uh, on direct numerical simulation to understand what's going on, or experiments, or uh, whatever. Uh, that's uh, something very important. However, something that uh, still uh, remains up to uh, localized turbulence is that the, this is nearly constant over the representative elementary volume. And this is also nearly constant over the representative elementary volume. So if you have a flow, a very big reservoir, for instance, but locally, the pressure gradient is linear and the velocity is constant, very locally. It will change at larger scales, but uh, it will not change uh, for the risk of the And this, sorry? The spectrum in this case of turbulence in the media, the reference scale and the force scale, it is related to the geometry or to the flow field? I will comment on that later. You can still work with the uh, geometrical characteristic length, but I will show later that this is not the, uh, enough. Uh, you have to think in terms of also topology of the, of the system because of these, uh, uh, these two different types of bifurcation. Actually, there are many, many others uh, associated to, uh, to uh, Navier-Stokes equation. And up to localized turbulence. So if, if the turbulence is locally periodic over some number of unit cells, I can still work with that, but probably with some time average here uh, that uh, will uh, help me to get uh, uh, constant, uh, constant stuff. Otherwise, you have to work with a macro, what I call macroscale turbulence. Okay, so now, oops. Uh, <coughs> very uh, small, uh, uh, rapid presentation of the, of the Darcy regime uh, because it, it, I need to that for, uh, for going further. Well, I'm not going to comment too much on the, on the equation for the deviation of velocity and pressure, but uh, the important thing is that 
these equations are linear. I have killed everything nonlinear has been killed here through this real number. Therefore, this is linear. And I can think a solution in terms of a linear combination of, uh, of, of uh, the, the things. And, and therefore, the, one of the easiest way to represent this linear combination is just by the introduction of here a mapping vector B that maps the, the average velocity onto the uh, pressure deviation and something that maps the average velocity onto the velocity deviation. This is on the PDF, so I'm not going to work too much, but the result is that uh, I can calculate capital B and, and, and uh, small b, and the result is that I have here Darcy's law, in which I have an anisotropic permeability tensor, which is given by those mapping, mapping variable. So don't look at the mathematics of that, but remember that, well, the, given the structure of the system, I can solve for that, there is no viscosity in this equation, therefore the uh, permeability is defined uh, and does not depend on, on viscosity, which is something that uh, uh, Jesus has, has commented this morning. So this is uh, the uh, classical uh, Darcy, uh, Darcy regime uh, stuff. And now, well, something uh, which is practical if you want to calculate the effective permeability is probably to revert to uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of problems, which I will use uh, for the nonlinear, uh, for inertia terms, and I will use the, also this afternoon for non-Newtonian fluid. So instead, uh, I, I just write the uh, uh, Navier-Stokes equation here uh, f with a source term here, which is the gradient of the average pressure. So I, I can remember these terms locally is constant, uh, and therefore, this term is constant, and therefore I have to calculate for v beta and p beta, and this is something which is done uh, uh, over, for instance, X-ray tomographic images. I will comment this afternoon on, on the, the kind of boundary condition you can use around that. This is not uh, uh, a simple uh, question. It's, it's, this is still open, but I will comment that for the non-Newtonian non case. So what do we have? Now I will increase the Reynolds number and go through all those uh, the regimes I have described before. Uh, there is a, so if uh, there is a, the Reynolds number is uh, sufficiently large, but not in the macro turbulence regime. So it, it's large enough. There are things, uh, uh, it's not uh, the creeping flow regime uh, anymore. Uh, so I have the uh, impact of inertia, but it's not, it's not a fully turbulent, uh, turbulent system. The uh, one typical heuristic equation, which is called a Forsheimer or Argon equation, is the following. I, I have here Darcy's law, in which this is the intrinsic average pressure. I have the filtration velocity, the, so the um, average of the, the velocity. And I have uh, the Darcy term here, and I have written for an isotropic uh, permeability. And here, an additional term, which uh, scales are the square of the velocity. This is the classical heuristic equation. Uh, but I will show uh, uh, in the next uh, slides that this is not the, the, the correct representation of all the regimes I have described before. So instead, if you do upscaling, you essentially found that you have uh, some sort of apparent Darcy's law in which this permeability is now nonlinear and depends on the velocity. You, you may use that. Mostly, for instance, people working on, on, on numerical modeling, they just do that. But in terms of understanding what's going on, it's uh, interesting to write that in terms of deviation to Darcy's law. So I have Darcy's law plus an additional term, and I'm going to look at this Forsheimer term, if you want. But this is a generalized Forsheimer term. Uh, generalized because it's not, it does not scale as the square, the square of the velocity. So F here is represented versus the Reynolds number, in which here, but that's uh, uh, I will comment on that later. The, the um, length scale is just a square root of the permeability. But if you can choose uh, something else, it will not change anything. So I, I have the following things. Uh, I depart from Darcy's law with a square of the velocity. So that means this term is cubic. Then I have a transition regime. And some time. But... Uh, uh, I have a, a quadratic regime uh, later. So F uh, scales with the velocity and therefore this term is quadratic. So, uh, so uh, here there is, and look at the, the span 
the, the order of magnitude of, over which uh, there are all these transitions can be very large. It depends on the structure of the medium, but it can be very large. Uh, so uh, using the, uh, just for Scheimer law, for instance, can be misleading in terms of quantitative analysis. So remember that there are many different things. Uh, and which I summarize here. I, I, we, I have this creeping regime, f is equal to zero. I have the weak inertia regime for which it scales with the square root of the velocity, the, it scales with the, this term scales with the cubic uh, and the, the, of the velocity. And uh, I have a strong inertia regime before macroscale turbulence in which it scales with the square, uh, the square of the velocity. In the literature, we found a lot of things uh, trying to uh, explain why we have a cubic term. I'm going to skip that today, uh, and I just uh, so I refer to the uh, to the slides and in which I will talk about the. Uh, I can try to solve the, for the problem by uh, using expansion in terms of the Reynolds number uh, and trying to find that. And the, it turns out that the first correction uh, is uh, is uh, uh, cubic. Uh, this is something. Uh, which is uh, important. And now let us go to strong inertia. Strong inertia is a little bit more involved because uh, now I have to rely, uh, I have to have a full uh, uh, nonlinear non system. So the best way to, to look at that is just to solve the problem. Imposing the gradient of the average pressure, I impose that, I calculate V beta and P beta tilde. Usually, it's interesting to look at V beta in terms of the uh, magnitude and, and the orientation. And if I do that, I can write this generalized uh, uh, Forsheimer equation uh, under the form of, uh, uh, of something which is the, I would call that the Darcy term. So that would be the contribution of Darcy, but it is modified by two things. First, there is a rotation here. So the, the, the inertial velocity is not necessarily along the velocity that would be provided by Darcy's law. So that's something very important. And this is typical, for instance, for arrays of uh, uh, tubes or uh, things like that. Uh, so, so there is a rotation, potential rotation of, of the, axis, the principal axis for, uh, for the permeability. And there is also a nonlinear term here. I have already commented on that. That depends on the Reynolds number with uh, possibly square, uh, uh, cubic, uh, and all sorts of, all sort of things. So I'm not going... Yes? Sorry? Yes. So something that uh, uh, I already introduced, uh, I'm going to go rapidly th through that. The um, Reynolds number, what L? Well, there are many possibilities, so I already introduced uh, the, the square root of k. Well, k, for instance, for a bundle of cubes is epsilon uh, d squared over the 32. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, if I take the square root of that, I will have the porosity involved here. So it's not, does not look nice. So most of the time, people, they take that. And there are also, as I already mentioned, there are um, uh, topological problem. If I take, uh, I solve the Navier-Stokes equation over various types of media, I often get several curves, uh, curves here, and those curves actually can be assembled, more or less, by introducing some uh, uh, length scale which is, depends on the topology of the system. This is very important. Uh, let's take, for instance, the case of a bundle of, uh, of tubes. If I have a flow perpendicular to the tubes, uh, I have uh, uh, something which is not prone to the turbulence bifurcation uh, unless you go to very high Reynolds number. If I go along the tubes, then this is a supercritical uh, uh, instability and therefore uh, and can go rapidly from laminar flow to turbulence. And therefore the, the, the two situations are different. So I need something, uh, I need to correct the Reynolds number with something that depends on the orientation of the system. And uh, so typically for uh, the uh, arrays of cylinders I have to introduce a characteristic length which is multiplied by something like that. And this is very useful for instance if you want to solve flow over canopies, I don't no, if you see, the, the, so canopy is something like that. I have a, um, trees or um, threads or whatever. And, and so I have a flow, Navier-Stokes flow. I have something entering the pulse medium here. And I have the, the flexible uh, 
flexible uh, uh, trees, for instance, uh, that move and that will essentially uh, trigger uh, what is called uh, some sort of uh, instability, which is called onami. And therefore, since those, uh, those are moving, I need to know to be able to calculate the permeability in all the, the apparent permeability in all directions. And the uh, last, uh, last, uh, last thing in terms of one phase flow is the, uh, uh, all those transition regimes have been observed experimentally. This is one example here. Uh, so the uh, uh, first correction uh, versus the Reynolds number, and you, you see or here the weak inertial term, which is almost uh, a slope of two. And if you look at the uh, correction at larger Reynolds number, I get something which is more or less close to a quadratic, uh, quadratic system. And uh, <coughs> so I'm going to skip the, uh, the uh, uh, macroscale turbulence uh, stuff because I don't think this is very useful for most of the application. And what I want to just uh, say a few words about two-phase flow uh, here. So two-phase flow, I have a, a beta phase and a gamma phase here uh, flowing in the system. There is a, a quasi-static theory, which is generalized Darcy's law. So I have a mass balance for the phase alpha. I have a, some sort of general Darcy's law with a, a permeability tensor here that depends on, on the saturation here and the classical capillary and relative permeability. Does that work for inertia terms? This is the question. And uh, it turns out that well, you need, if you want to, and I will finish on that, if you want to model the phenomenology of the system, if the Reynolds number is sufficiently large, then you have to take into account two additional mechanisms. Uh, viscous coupling between the two phases, which is uh, uh, handled by adding a terms in the general Zarcy's law. So I have an interaction here between the, uh, let's say, the beta phase and the gamma phase. So I have those additional terms. This is one thing. And if I had uh, uh, inertia terms, then I have to add another contribution, which is something which looks like a generalized Forsheimer term. So the, the candidate uh, for uh, uh, something uh, which is two-phase flow in highly permeable media is, uh, uh, is uh, a complicated generalized Darcy's law with additional terms. And uh, is, is it important? If you for instance, do a column experiment over a system made of uh, beads of, uh, let's say, f four or five millimeters. Uh, and uh, you can look at the pressure gradient in the, in the liquid phase versus the Reynolds number, and it will look something like that. It goes down. So there is some sort of, uh, this is related to the weight of the column. So there is some sort of lifting mechanism. It goes down, and then it goes up again. So what's going on here? Here I have a viscous interaction that tends to lift the liquid column. And uh, this, uh, when the flow becomes turbulent, then this lifting effect uh, becomes smaller. And uh, if you want to uh, model that, then it's clearly you need the additional, this, this generalized equation written with the classical Darcy term plus the additional terms. If you put that to zero, you get this curve here. So no way to describe that. Otherwise, if you add those terms, uh, then you can have the, the viscous interaction will decrease the, the, the lift and then the, will increase the lift, uh, sorry, and then turbulence will, uh, okay, inertia will uh, tend to diminish, to decrease that. Well, that's the, um, I think I will stop there. There, there are additional things in the, in the, um, in the slides, uh, and so if people have time to look at that, uh, they, they will be able to um, uh, Oops, sorry, to uh, uh, ask me questions. Uh, but I'm leaving on Thursday for, uh, because I'm going to another summer school. So please do that before, uh, before I leave. So essentially, for one phase flow, there, is a, there are several regimes. That's uh, the important message. For two phase flow, you need to add additional features in the general Darcy's law if you want to take into account the effect uh, of a phase lifting and inertia, and of course, uh, you understand that all that has an impact on other transport mechanisms. So we have worked on uh, turbulence, the transport of uh, concentration, for instance, or heat for turbulence or inertia effects, etc. I'm not going to comment uh, on that, but of course, dispersion, for instance, changes with the regimes you are uh, you are working on. So that's the. Um,
summary uh, of this uh, technical, uh, technical uh, stuff. So remember, different regimes uh, that depends on, on, the, on the Reynolds number. There is a discussion on how to define the correct Reynolds number. Uh, it clearly depends on the structure of your medium. Uh, and uh, the uh, transitions are uh, numerous, so the, you have to take care of, uh, of that depending on your applications. Uh, and often the literature, most of the literature on inertia terms was based on, on chemical engineering applications. But in chemical engineering, you have a column, and so you, do, uh, you have a one-dimensional flow, uh, Reynolds number, and you look at that. Uh, and so people, for instance, they don't, they don't care too much about the, the, the cubic regime, for instance, on the over transition, because most of their applications, they are a large Reynolds number. But if you are in a, uh, around the well, for instance, or, or over application, then there are places where the velocity is zero, places where the velocity is high, and, and many things in between. So you have to be very careful if you want to do a quantitative analysis to have the correct representation of those inertia effects in the, in the system. <clears throat> well, um, I, I skipped a few. So, uh, on one hand, there is this uh, capillary dominated flow, with, uh, with, for which, quote, uh, capillary, uh, generalized RC slow works uh, more or less. And then I presented stuff for uh, highly permeable media for which capillary uh, actually does not play an, a very important role. Uh, and so I discussed the viscous coupling and the uh, uh, and the uh, inertia, inertia effect, but there is a lot of, uh, uh, once again, uh, the, the story would be much, much more complicated. And there are many different uh, cases in which capillary sort, sort of plays a, a limited role, but it's, it's still there, and then there are inertia and there are things. And so the, the whole story about two-phase flow is quite, is quite complicated. Uh, but uh, for the uh, experiments I have presented for which the viscous coupling and the inertia term is very important, capillary pressure does not play a, a big role. No, uh, the, the one for two-phase flow or? Uh? This one, yes. No, uh, the uh, here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, the, the the question of drag or. Uh, uh, Woody curves or whatever uh, is more related to one of the graphs I have presented where F, the, the correction, the Forsheimer correction, uh, changes a lot uh, depending on the Reynolds number. Yeah. So this would be equivalent. Uh, for instance, if you have a, here but here this is different. Here I have a, I have a, actually the Reynolds number is still, I don't have the, the picture, but the Reynolds number is about here uh, for this particular case, uh, 20 to 30. So it's not, not a turbulence uh, stuff. Uh, so here I have a viscous lifting, the uh, shear rate applied to the interface uh, of the liquid, uh, the two liquids or the two phases, just lift a little bit the, 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 uh, the other phase. And therefore, if I compare the pressure drop to the weight of the, uh, of the uh, liquid column, it, it looks like it's a little bit smaller. So nothing to do with a high Reynolds number, <coughs> but still now I'm departing from the creeping flow regime and, and as, as soon as I increase the Reynolds number, then this lifting effect tends to decrease, uh, which is classical in free mechanics, so I'm not going to comment too much on that. Yeah. By one? Ran ah, randomness. Yes. Uh, those uh, pictures actually were essentially uh, of, uh, of pedagogical interest, yeah, so yeah, just yeah. To, to show that. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the uh, randomness will change a lot of things. Uh, I'm going to actually to comment that later on. Um, but let me go through the, um, the way I wrote the uh, Darcy's law. The, the, uh, here, uh, so I have the Darcy term, which is corrected by a rotation matrix, and then uh, some sort of nonlinear uh, Forsheimer term. 
that depends on V to the power of something. If I have a random system, this matrix will tend to become unity. That's, uh, that's an interesting thing. So if you have a truly random system, then this is always the case uh, when you do upscaling. If you have a random system, uh, it makes life simpler uh, most of the time. Uh, and therefore, uh, if I work, uh, I, I will show that for uh, the, the non-Newtonian case, which is also almost, almost similar the, this afternoon. I have an illustration of that. I don't have that for the... Uh, for the, this inertial term, but uh, this, is, this is how it works. So essentially, if I have a completely uh, disordered system, I will have only to take care about f, and this will be one, the, the unity. And the crossover to the Ah, it changes. It changes. Uh, <coughs> there, I did not comment too much on that, but here, uh, look, uh, there are... Uh, um, there are rocks, there are uh, simple arrays, uh, and uh, look at that. Those, uh, the the re critical Reynolds number, if there is one, would be very different here, uh, because it's uh, it's only based on on, on k, the, the square root of k, which is not. Uh, uh, it does say a few things about topology, but not not a lot. Especially, it does not say anything about bifurcation in, in the system, and therefore uh, it doesn't work very well. Uh, if you want to, uh, so, but this is still an open question. D can we uh, define a much better uh, Reynolds number? Uh, I, what we want to do is uh, to add in a Reynolds number something that de depends on the topology. But this is still an open problem. So w we did that because uh, uh, of this canopy problem, for instance, because I have to do that. But this is still an open question. Uh, uh, and the case of a uh, Arrays of uh, tubes, for instance, is, is, the, is the worst because they, we know that bifurcation in this direction are completely different from the bifurcation for flow along this direction. Therefore, there is a tremendous difference between the topological uh, aspects due to the inertia effect in the, in the system. This is an open question. So on, uh, my uh, view of that is still uh, quite open to any proposal. <laughs> but we, we did a few things to, to work on that because if you... Uh, work on canopies, for instance, we, you, you need that. If you have a system which is not deformable, you can draw a table of uh, uh, F for uh, all directions, or it's, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not easy to do that. So if you have a, some sort of theory that gives you an idea of the, uh, of the correction, topological correction, then it's much, much more efficient. So our idea was to uh, actually try to use the... Uh, Actually, when you, uh, what you need to know is what is the importance of those terms. And you can estimate that importance using the creeping flow regime. It already gives you something. If you do creeping flow regime for a flow, a Poisson flow, for instance, these terms will be zero. <laughs> and if you have the flow perpendicular to the array of cylinders, uh, then it won't, won't be zero. So, so those, uh, just calculating that gives an idea of the potential for uh, different types of bifurcation in the system. But this is really an open question, and, and I, would not, I would not say this is something that uh, has reached the engineering practice. It's not, not yet that. But we, we need that for uh, many applications. So you have to, well, it's almost the same uh, <laughs> uh, than the, for the canopy system. I, I did not, because uh, uh, the canopy, here, actually, uh, the, uh, actually the, the uh, porosity changes a little bit because the flexion, the deformation of, uh, here I only represent a few of those uh, trees. But imagine there are many trees here, and the deformation here is a little bit different from the deformation here. So I have a, uh, a change in the topology and, and the porosity or local porosity of the, of the system. And so I need to do something. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, the, the, the <coughs> you, so you should tabulate everything or try to find a nice representation of that. Uh, here we had a, a representation of K versus the uh, orientation of the fibers and orientation of the velocity. So imagine there are many parameters here. It's uh, quite complicated. But you need that if you have evolving porosities uh, with time, for instance, in dissolution or whatever, uh, or deformation. Uh, there is no, 
Upscaling cannot say uh, anything more. <laughs> Upscaling in that case just says that, well, locally you have a, mm, a constant gradient of the average pressure, you have a constant average velocity, and they are linked together through a nonlinear relationship. And you cannot say any more. Uh, you can say more. You, if you want to say uh, more, then you have to solve for the uh, local. Uh, uh, with that framework, uh, but you have to solve for the local uh, velocity and pressure and, and see and calculate the uh, apparent, apparent permeability, which is complicated because uh, uh, the, the, it depends on a lot, a lot of things. I am open to any questions uh, <laughs> you may have. Uh, this is a quite complicated technical stuff. So, uh, so if you want to, that's why I gave the PDF. And if you want to have more uh, discussions about a few things, uh, this is, uh, I cannot make it uh, simpler. <laughs>